But we do want to emphasize that worship is something done by all of God's people who are here and not just by those who are on the stage. So we really do invite you to participate in this act of worship as we come to the Lord together. Okay, so let me pray for us. And after I pray, we're going to stand up and we're going to read out loud together our call to worship today, taken from Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1 to 3. But before we enter into that time, uh, please join me in prayer. Father, we come today only based on the blood of Christ. We do not presume to come to you with our own righteousness. We don't presume to come to you with our own religiosity and morality. We don't presume to come to you with the list of things we have or have not done. We know that all those things are like dirty rags before your holiness. The only thing, Father, that'll make us sufficient to enter into a relationship with the Holy God is the forgiveness we've been given by him who died for us on that cross. When he took all of our sins upon himself and given us a righteousness we never deserved. As we ponder upon that, let us today enter into this time of worship with vigor, with fervor, with power, knowing that the same God who died for us is now receiving all the glory for which he died for. Be pleased today, Father, by the worship of our mouths, by the songs we sing from our hearts, and may the gospel be clear as we continue in this time of worship today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, I invite us to stand. And let's read in one voice, out loud together, our call to worship today, Take it from Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1 to 3. Please read with me. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Amen. Friends, what a joy it is to worship the Lord together. in darkness, I was in darkness. 
But Spirit, you made me see. I swore. I swore I knew the way on my own. Half full of rocks and heart made of stone. But Spirit, you moved in me. And at your touch, at your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened. Now on my
us bow our heads and pray one more time. Heavenly Father, blessed are you, Lord, our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, our high tower, a safe place in a time of battle. Lord, we know that you provide for us all things, and you know that you have given us your son to ensure that we will overcome the trials that do come in this life. But Father, we confess that we often fall into the trap of self-sufficiency, and we fail to see that you are indeed our hiding place. Lord, as we come to you in a time of confession today, I pray that you send your Holy Spirit to reveal to us the ways in which we have depended on our own limited and flawed strength and wisdom instead of yours, that we may come to you and receive that which you have freely given. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, one theological concept that has really struck a chord with me in the past couple of years is this very much biblical idea of super abundance, right? And this is what the call to worship passage really brings out. And the biblical idea of super abundance is not like what those preaching prosperity theology might tell you. It's not that if you do some good things and routinely perform your religious duties, somehow you'll be blessed by God with material wealth or you know, physical health or anything like that. Rather, the biblical idea of abundance is that God, the creator of heaven and earth, has graciously and freely and generously provided for us. And that now he is actually inviting us to enjoy something that is much more satisfying and fulfilling than anything that money can buy. Therefore, we don't have to frantically go on this journey um, and, and battle of trying to provide for ourselves because there's something more meaningful. And verses 2 and 3 of our call to worship tells us exactly what that is. It's listening diligently to Him. That is eating what is good and delighting in luxurious food. Coming to Him and hearing Him is the nourishment that will make our souls live. It's clear, isn't it? That being able to draw near to God Himself is itself the highest delight, the most nourishing and refreshing thing that is going to keep us going. That's why we set aside our precious time our weekly to come here and focus just for a little while to drawing near to Him so that we can feast on Him while being reminded that we are living in the midst of God's generous grace. Because it's so easy to forget, isn't it, in our daily lives, this is certainly not how the economy of the world works. In the secular, godless wor world, there isn't anything that's more satisfying than what money can buy. Because anything that is satisfying and necessary requires money to have. You see, we can't get away from it. Everything needs money without it. Our families will not be harmonious. We won't have a roof over our heads. Our kids can't go to school. We won't have anything to eat. And that's not far from true, right? Money does have a role in pretty much every aspect of our lives. But because money is so prevalent, the danger is then to take money, which is this good thing that God has given us as a tool to more conveniently share His blessings with other people to one another, and then regard it as the source of blessing instead of merely the means that we happen to be given to use to enjoy the blessing, giving it credit for making the blessing possible instead of God, like as if it's the fountain itself and not just the cup. And do you know what is the most telling sign that you have bought into this lie? It's when we are willing to sin, to ignore or even willingly and knowingly disobey God who is the fount of every blessing in order to get the money that we think we need to secure our own blessing. And then once we have the, our fill of what we want, we pridefully give ourselves credit for it, forgetting 
from whom was really all of our blessings given. This is what Agur in the proverb says, he prays he will be spared of. He asked for neither poverty nor riches. Praying to God to not have poverty makes total sense. I'm sure we all share this prayer. But Agur has the wisdom to not want riches as well. Why? Because both states actually puts money in the center of attention, as the center of focus. And when we do that, and start defining ourselves in terms of our money, or how much money we have, or seeing money as the solution to our problems, then we take it out of the roles as means, where it is actually a good thing, and then we put it in the role of God, and source, where it can only lead to a rupture of relationship with God, and eventually, our own destruction. This is what our confession of sin text tells us. So let us read our confession of sin with me, taken from Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 to 9. This is the word of God. Two things I ask of you, deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches, Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Friends, let us confess the ways in which we have made wealth our Lord and neglected our duties to the true Lord of our lives in our silent prayers of confession. Heavenly Father, we confess, Lord, that our perspectives are so limited. We are so short-sighted that we miss the fact that daily, every breath that we take, we get from you. Every bite, every calorie that we have which energizes, you have given it to us graciously. Yet we anxiously, frantically try to acquire for ourselves these blessings. We put this pressure on ourselves, which you have always intended to take off. Lord, I pray that you can show us by your Holy Spirit the foolishness of this. Give us the perspective of work that allows us to endeavor and strive for you to honor what you have given us and relieve from us this lie that tells us that if we are not breaking our backs, we will not survive. Because the source of all life what will make our bodies and soul live is the bread that comes from you that will never make us hunger again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, if we have ever fallen into this trap of making money our Lord, one of the sure ways that we're going to get out of it is through the Lord's discipline. And this will come in the form of God showing us how powerless our wealth actually is. Either by taking it away to expose how over-dependent we have become to it, or by actually letting the things that we enjoy through our wealth grow more worthless and unsatisfying. But for those who are being saved, for those who have faith in Christ, we have this assurance. That whatever financial situation we're in, though it may be uncomfortable, though God may take away for a little while the blessings and the enjoyment that worldly wealth can give us, this is never an act of God's hostility towards us. But it is always a part of God's loving discipline. And we know this because the Bible tells us that Jesus has taken on the hostility that we deserve for disrespecting God on himself on the cross. So there is no more hostility between God and us, and therefore we can now be treated as sons. We don't need to put our trust in money. 
we have our Heavenly Father who has adopted us to trust on, who though will, dis- will definitely discipline us when it becomes necessary, but in all things is always bringing us from one degree of glory to another through His loving commitment to us. So friends, hear now your assurance of pardon taken from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. This is the Word of God. Consider Him who endured from sinners such hostility against Himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My sons, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him. For the Lord disciplines the one He loves and chastises every son whom He receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? So let us fight sin to the point of shedding blood, knowing that this is the father's discipline for us. Amen. Friends, let's all stand together. Sing this song.
Our statement of faith today comes from Westminster Larger Catechism, question and answer 45. I will read the question. Please read out loud the answer with me. How is Christ a king? As king, Christ calls a people for himself out of the world and gives them officers, laws, and the authority to condemn by which he visibly governs them. He bestows saving grace on his elect, rewards their obedience, corrects them for their sins, preserves and supports them in all their temptations and sufferings, restrains and overcomes all their enemies, and powerfully orders everything for his own glory and their well-being. As king, Christ also executes just retribution against all others who neither know God nor obey the gospel. Amen. Thank you, Jane, for that. And friends, if you're new to CCC and you're wondering why we read these documents, that's not from the Bible, uh, because they are summaries, uh, these documents, we believe, of what the Bible teaches. And we try to match what we read and learn that Sunday with the sermon uh, passage itself, okay? And as we'll see later, it's all about the resurrection of Christ. And as King is what we're going to learn uh, later. So friends, as we enter into this time of uh, offering, uh, gifts and offering, just to re remind ourselves again that if you're not a member at CCC, don't feel pressure to give to CCC, but we do want to encourage you to give to your local church, wherever it is that you're a member in, so that you can support their work and their ministry. But if you are a member at CCC, uh, then it is a duty and delight of the members of a church to help the sustenance of the church that they're in. If you'd like to give to us, there'll be um, a QR code behind uh, my, the screen, also in the printouts, and also there'll be an offering bag that we pass around if you prefer to give by cash. Just to summarize again all that we've learned so far, uh, the giving of our gifts or any good works that we do does not in any way make God love us more or less because his love for us, uh, those who have trusted in Christ as Lord and Savior, is secured and solidified and perfected on the cross alone. We do this not to earn love, but to express our thankfulness for his love upon which he has poured upon all who believed in him. So friends, I'm gonna pray for us and then we'll continue in our worship as we enter into our time of gifts and offering. Pray with me. Father, we thank you that you sent your son. He who is rich became poor for us on that cross so that we, through his poverty, may become spiritually rich. He said no to the world so that we may gain heaven. He died naked without anything so that we can be clothed in righteousness that was not our own. Help your church now, Father, respond to this great love and be uh, empowered in our hearts um, to worship you through all the resources upon you, which you have entrusted to us. Thank you, Father, and uh, be with us as we continue to worship you through our gifts and offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. sing my wealth my wealth is in the cross there's nothing more i want than just to know his love my heart is set on christ and i will count all else as loss the greatest of my crowns mean nothing to me now for i counted up the cost and all my wealth is in 
cross. Sing, I will not boast. I will not boast in Jesus. I have no pride in gold. But Amen. Friends, pray with me one more time. Father, those words were easy to say and easy to sing, but it takes a lifetime to really truly believe in what we just sung and live it out. I pray that you be gracious, Father, not only to all of your children here, but also to this church, that we would use the resources that you've entrusted to us, um, not as the ultimate goal itself, but rather merely as a tool to preach your gospel, to worship your name, to bring about your glory here on earth as it is in heaven. And I pray, Father, as we do that, um, the, the other churches in the city will also join in this merciful grace upon you uh, that you will grant to us, that we would love you, the gift giver, more than the gift itself, whatever that gift may be. And Father, we also pray as we uh, continue to pray for the health of other churches in this church, for the individual members in this church that you may help us use our resources as we um, guide and disciple your people that you've entrusted to us here um, from birth till they see you again in glory. And Father, with that we pray uh, for the two new births that our church recently experienced, the son of Elis and Aaron, Isaiah Pribadi, and the daughter of Harris and Claudia, Ava Sky Gozali. We pray for them 
for their new families that you would help um, imprint a gospel DNA in the ecosystem of their family by the way that um, uh, Ellis Aaron, Harris Claudia love one another and exemplify this very conceptual love of Christ more tangibly by the way they treat and love one another. <coughs> With that, Father, we also pray uh, for a few deaths uh, that our family members of our church members have experienced. Um, Ibu Amelia Elias, uh, the mother of Papa Randy, and the mother-in-law of Ibu Yolanda. And also pray for Theodore's aunt um, as their family also goes through a, a death. And Father, as we lift uh, them up to you, we know that you love and care for your people uh, and that um, uh, your gospel power will help endure them, we pray, as they go through this season of mourning. And Father, whether from cradle to glory, we rely upon you and we um, rest in the fact that you will bring us to the end. Protect us, Father, along the way and allow this church to do its part in guiding your people there. Father, we end this time of intercessory prayer in the way that you have taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, welcome again to CCC. Two very quick announcements before I dismiss the kids. Uh, the first one, just a reminder for all of us that this is the month. Uh, there's going to be a few months throughout the year that we're going to encourage you guys to check in through Church Center uh, just because the church is growing, which is exciting. But we also want to know and keep track about how our members are doing and where they're at. Um, so if you don't mind, for the month of November, just check in, tell us that you're here, that you're still uh, um, coming to worship and uh, still amongst us. Uh, it'd be much easier for us to then keep track and, 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 and uh, help and ask those who probably have not been coming uh, how they're doing as we seek them out. And also uh, for parents, uh, after service today, we're going to have a community group leaders meeting uh, here in the sanctuary. So if, you, if your children are in the um, children ministry, if you don't mind to uh, pick them up uh, right away so that we can quickly move on to the next event we've got going on today, okay? That will be much appreciated. Okay, with that, I want to dismiss the kids. Uh, if, you have your, if your children want to join the uh, Sunday schools, for their age groups, go and exit to the door on my left. And as the parents take their kids there, uh, the rest of us, I want to invite us to stand up and let's greet each other in the name of the Lord. Okay. All right. Morning, guys. So uh, I'm Rosalind from the women's ministry. Um, just wanted to share an announcement. Um, I guess the most exciting time of the year, it's coming. And uh, for those of you who will still be here, we will do paint and karaoke. Woo! Woo-hoo! So if you, uh, you will still be here, uh, please join us. It will be on de December 16 at 2 p.m. Uh, the location will be at Setia Budi area. It will be at uh, the Peak Sudirman apartment and uh, in the function room, and one person will cost uh, 60,000 rupiah. So please join us, and you can register through Church Center app um, by December 9th. Um, but it's, it will only be available by tonight uh, due to some technical issue. So tomorrow you can register. Um, yeah, and um, hope you can join us. See you there. Thanks, Ross. I never get applauses when I do announcements, <laughs> but it's fine. Um, a quick two more announcements before we begin our sermon today. Um, welcome lunch, November 26. Uh, so after church on November 26, we'll have a welcome lunch. If you want to be part of that, you want to fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ, after the service, please go to the welcome booth and you can sign up there and, and tell them that you want to be part of that. They'll give you more details about when and where and rides and different things like that. And the second announcement I've already announced last time is that we have a woman's Advent Bible study. Uh, it will just be two studies, two meetings, uh, which will meet uh, here at 
uh, at this building on the 15th floor above us. You'll see, if you go to the 15th floor through the elevator, you'll see signs that'll lead you to the room. And I'll be leading that. It'll take place next Sunday and the Sunday after, okay? Uh, from 8.45 to 9 a.m. Uh, on the 15th floor, okay? So please join us, no, so, sorry, 8.45 to 10 a.m. 15 minutes is not sufficient for a Bible study. Um, 8.45 to 10 a.m. on the 15th floor, and we're just gonna trace how the advent of Jesus actually started all the way back in the Old Testament. It's been anticipated all the way from Genesis 3. We're gonna trace that to the coming of Christ. And also, uh, the second week, we're gonna talk about how when Christ came, uh, although he did victor over death, yet the world we're currently in still has a lot of misery and death and tears involved. So how do we live in this already but not yet season until Jesus comes again? the second time, okay? So come and register through the Church Center app uh, and you can register from there under registrations, I believe, okay? So please do so then. All right, that's it for the announcements. Let me pray and then we'll jump in our sermon for today. Let's pray. Father, as we open up your word, I pray that you be gracious first and foremost to me for my words to be accurate and so that I don't end up putting words into your mouth, um, something that every preacher should be scared about doing. And I pray also for those who are hearing your word that you would bring these truths deeper into a level of their hearts that no preacher has the ability to do, that your spirit would take these truths and implant them um, in their souls, in their bones, in their hearts so that it could really change who they are as they are transformed from one degree of glory to another, as they behold Christ and his cross and the implications that cross has to the rest of their lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so friends, we're continuing today. Actually, we are ending today. This will be our last sermon in this particular sermon series through the book of Revelation. Okay, remember we never set out to do the whole book. We just set out to do two chapters of the book, Revelation chapter two and three, um, where God specifically addresses seven different churches that at the time existed while the book of Revelation was being written. Okay, so we're at the seventh church right now. We're at the last church. And we also saw how since the number seven in the Bible represents wholeness, it represents completeness, we, we, we saw how these evaluations that God gave to these seven churches weren't just meant specifically, strictly, to these seven particular churches. It was actually meant for the whole church. It, it's an evaluation of the state of the whole church, the collective big C church, that has, is, and will exist till Jesus comes again. Okay, so this is a rebuke for, for all of us, including CCC. And as we've seen the past few weeks, as a whole, these evaluations have not been great especially for this last church that we're gonna talk about today, which is the church in Laodicea, okay? Out of the seven churches, this one was doing particularly bad to the point where God said, we'll read it later, that if they don't repent, he'll spit them out of his mouth. It's pretty bad. But question is, what was so bad about this church in Laodicea, okay? Well, let me give you the quick answer here, and then we're gonna spend the whole sermon teasing it out. But in summary, the reason why this church in Laodicea it was in sh such bad shape is because they have weakened the resurrection power of Christ from within their midst. They have weakened, they have dulled the power of Jesus' resurrection from within their midst. Now, what will make our conversation today a bit more complicated is that there's a lot of confusion behind what that phrase even means, right? the power of Jesus' resurrection. You guys ever heard a pastor or a Christian say, in the power of Jesus, you know, and then fill in the blank, right? You hear it all the time. In the power of Jesus, and then you fill in kind of a personal request form. Now, when they say that, what power do you think that phrase is referring to there? Well, it's the power that raised Jesus up from the dead. That's what they're appealing to. And the understanding there is that if you can somehow tap into this power that resurrected Jesus from the dead, which is a real power, by the way, the Bible talks about it a lot, 
But the understanding or the misunderstanding there is that if you can somehow tap into the resurrection power, you can manifest whatever it is your heart desires. You can get healed, you can get clients, you can get money. And, and the question that I think this passage is presenting to us today is whether or not that's the correct way to understand Jesus' resurrection power. Is it a means for us to kind of manifest our own personal agendas? And if not, then what is it a means for? What does it even feel like to have it? Have we, CCC, dulled the power of Jesus' resurrection from within our midst? Do we even know what that feels like to have? Because if, if, if we have dulled it, that means we're in the bottom of the ladder with the church in Laodicea. Are we there? How can we know? Well, let's dive in. Okay, this is God's rebuke to the last church out of the seven in Laodicea. This is the word of God. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor, neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with our father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thus says the Lord. Okay, three things I want to point out from the passage today about Jesus' resurrection. First, why it's a non-negotiable. Two, how it has counterfeits. And three, what makes it better. Okay? Why it's a non-negotiable, how it has counterfeits, and what makes the resurrection of Christ better than these counterfeits. Let's, let's start with the first point. Why is the resurrection of Christ a non-negotiable? So let me just start off by showing you where in the passage do we even see this emphasis of Jesus' resurrection power? Because that actual phrase, the resurrection of Jesus, you don't see that in the passage anywhere, right? But in fact, it's the main theme. How so? Show me. Okay. Look at the way Jesus introduce, introduces himself in verse 14. Read verse 14 again. Jesus there introduces himself as the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Okay, now we've got to do some theologizing here, okay? So stick with me for a bit. But let me ask you, what do you think it means when Jesus said he's the beginning of God's creation? Like, what does that mean? Well, let's deduce this. Here's what it can't mean, okay? It can't mean that baby Jesus, right, like the human person Jesus that was born as a child on earth, was the beginning of God's creation. That can't be what he's referring to here, right? Why? Because obviously the human baby Jesus was born after the world was already created, right? So he can't be referring to baby Jesus. Okay, then some may say, maybe Jesus isn't referring to himself as the incarnate human child, right? But as God the Son, like the second person of the Trinity, who uh, be existed before the world was created, who existed before he took on flesh and become a human being, right? Maybe Jesus is referring to himself as, as that. Now, well, that's a better guess, but I also don't think that's quite right either. Why? Because many, many passages in the Bible says that God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, before he was incarnate as a human being, eternally existed with God the Father before anything else was created, okay? In other words, God the Son was not created. Remember when, when Jesus prayed in his high priestly prayer, I think it was John 17, right? 
He said this, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you when? Before the world existed. Before anything existed in eternity past, God the Son has always had the same glory as God the Father. So since God the Son is not a created being, therefore he cannot be the beginning of God's creation. You see what I'm saying? Following? Okay. So then, the question remains, at what point is his existence, Jesus referring, is Jesus referring to here, as the point of when he says he's the beginning of God's creation? Well, we've deduced, it's not the eternal state of him as God the Son before he was incarnate. Neither is it the state of him as the human baby Jesus when he was incarnate. But in fact, it's the state after he was resurrected from the dead. When he was resurrected from the dead, that's when he's referring to here as being the beginning of God's creation. What in the world? Okay, stick with me. Two more minutes, I promise. Actually, that's a lie. It'd be, it'd be more than two minutes. But just stick with me nonetheless, okay? Let me read to you Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and 18. And I think this will help. Paul says this. He says, he, Paul says, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. There it is again, that theme of the beginning of creation, firstborn of creation, okay? But what does that mean? Well, if you read verse 18 of Colossians chapter one, Paul continues and he says this. He's the beginning, he's the firstborn of all creation. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. This will all connect, just hang with me. Paul in Colossians chapter one connects Jesus as the firstborn of all creation to being equal as a firstborn from the dead. Where's the connection? Let me put it all together for us, okay? Colossians 1 and the whole Bible is saying that when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he became the firstborn and the beginning of God's creation. Or, more precisely, when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he became the firstborn and the beginning of God's new creation. When Jesus was resurrected, he was the first fruits, the Bible says elsewhere. He's the beginning of this process toward new creation. That's what Jesus meant here in verse 14 when he said that I'm the beginning of God's creation. What he's really saying more precisely is that he's the beginning of God's new creation. Now, why didn't he just say that? I don't know. You can ask him later. But that's, that's what he means here. Okay, He is the beginning of new creation. There will come a day the Bible says, where God will usher in a new creation and he'll make all things new. At times, this place has been called heaven. Jesus in the Lord's Prayer calls it earth as it is in heaven. Sometimes the book of Revelation calls it a new city. Other times it calls it a new heaven and a new earth. Either way, it's, a, it's this place where sin and death and tears are no more. Wars will end. Pain and suffering will be done with. But it's not only that. This is not only a place where everything bad will go away, but it's also a place, the Bible says, where everything true, good, and beautiful will finally find its origin. It's a place, C.S. Lewis famously said, where all the beauty that we've ever experienced in this world will finally found where it came from the deepest belly laughter you ever had with a friend. The tastiest bite of food you've ever chewed in your mouth. The sweetest song you've ever allowed to swallow you whole. The best shoulder cry you've ever had. The deepest loves your heart's ever stumbled upon. All of that, Lewis says, is but a scent of a flower we have not yet found, an echo of a tune we have not yet heard, and news from a country we have never yet visited. This country, this new creation, is where things are heading toward, God's saying. And the firstborn, the beginning, the pack leader that will lead us there is the resurrected Christ. He is the beginning. He's the first man who's ever beaten death and therefore is paving a way toward this deathless world. 
That's what Jesus means here. And we Christians, we're called to journey with him toward that. But the reason why, friends, our Christianity often feels dead is because we're not doing that. We're not journeying with this resurrected Christ toward this new creation. Why not? Because at some point, we've turned Jesus merely into a debt payer instead of a pack leader. We've made him a debt payer and not a pack leader. At some point, we've watered down the gospel and defined it merely as Jesus dying for my sins. Now, don't get me wrong. It is that. My goodness, it is that. But it's much more than that. The gospel isn't just that Jesus died for my sins. The gospel is that Jesus died for my sins so that I can victoriously march with him toward this new creation as I become an agent of renewal throughout the whole way. That's the good news. That's the gospel. And the Christians in Laodicea stopped doing that. They stopped being agents of renewal who were marching towards new creation. They were neither hot nor cold, God says. They were lukewarm. Now, what does that mean? A little bit more background on that, okay? Not long. Back then, pre-water purification technology, okay? A city was very dependent upon how good of the water source near them was, and the water source near Laodicea was, was a bad water source. Now, it just so happens that the two other cities near Laodicea had a good water source. One city's water source produced hot springs of water. It was good for healing wounds. It was good for other uses of purification. And the other city's water produced cold, good water for drinking for other and had other life-giving qualities. But the water source in Laodicea was famously known to be useless. It had things in it that made it undrinkable. It had things in it that made it unusable. And the temperature of it happened to be lukewarm. And this useless, lukewarm water is the analogy God used to describe the Christians in this church. They weren't being agents of renewal who were marching toward new creation with the risen Christ. They weren't doing any of that. They were lukewarm. They were lukewarm. Now, don't get me wrong. These lukewarm Christians were still saved born-again Christians. How do we know that? Look at verse 19. God there says, or describes them as those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. You see? These people are people that God still considers to be, what? His beloved. They were Christians. They were his. But their Christianity has become so powerless, so dead, that it's as useless as this lukewarm water. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they stop sharing the gospel to their neighbors. Maybe they stop participating in mercy ministry efforts that would renew the brokenness in their city as they show the gospel through word and deed. Lukewarmness can take many forms. But the point is, these guys have dampened Jesus' victorious resurrection power, and they're no longer doing gospel work through word or deed. And they're lukewarm. And if they repent, they'll be spat out. But see, the thing is, here's where it's tricky. I don't think they ever noticed this loss of power. I don't think they ever felt it. Why not? Because a very good counterfeit was close at hand. Let's go to our second point. How the power of Jesus' resurrection has counterfeits. Okay. Thanks for sticking with me through that technical kind of point, but I think that's necessary. But let me just summarize it real quick, okay, before we move forward. What we've seen is that if the power of Jesus' resurrection is truly present within our midst, we won't be lukewarm Christians, okay? But instead, we'll feel excitement and fervor and power that's going to drive us to become agents of renewal in the city that we're in, okay? That's what it means to have Jesus' resurrection power in our midst. But the thing about this church in Laodicea is instead of having this excitement and fervor and power that will make them agents of renewal on earth, instead, in verse 17, they said this, I'm rich. <laughs> I'm rich. That's what they said, literally. I'm rich, I've prospered, and I need nothing. Okay, now how in the world can being rich replace the excitement and the fervor and the power of Jesus' resurrection? Well, 
because it almost feels the same, doesn't it? Every good counterfeit has similarities to the real thing. What do I mean? Well, do you remember how you felt, friends, whenever you came across a lot of money in the past? Some of y'all are like, I'm still waiting, Tez. <laughs> okay. Well, do you remember then how you felt when you roped in that huge new client? Do you remember how you felt when you lobbied that huge new deal? Do you remember how you felt when you got that exciting dream promotion or that dream job? Remember what you felt? Didn't it feel exciting and fervorous and powerful and victorious? Some might even say it felt like a resurrection of sorts. Hmm? A taste of new hope. Every counterfeit has similarities with the real thing. Now, by the way, do you know all that a pastor needs to say in order to keep you in his church after you experience that financial victory? You wanna, you wanna, I'll tell you a secret. You know what a pastor needs to say? This is all he needs to say. All he needs to say is this. Praise the Lord. That was the power of Jesus. And all of a sudden, with that, the counterfeit work is complete. And you've been tricked. You think you're experiencing the power of Jesus' resurrection because it feels the same, but you're not. You may feel blessed and rich and wise and honorable, but look at the end of verse 17. If you believe that's a definition of Jesus' power of resurrection, in reality, you're pitiable, poor, blind and naked. Earthly riches is not what Jesus' resurrection power brings to the table. Don't let it fool you. Anoint your eyes, Jesus says at the end of verse 18. You gotta change your perspective. Anoint your eyes. We gotta stop looking at Jesus through the lenses of money. Switch it. We gotta start looking at money through the lenses of Jesus. Anoint your eyes. Resurrection power isn't seen by how rich you are. It's seen by how much you use your resources to be agents of gospel renewal on earth. Do you have resurrection power? Do you want it? But beware, Jesus says. You want it. You might get it. But when you get it, your life is going to be much harder. It will. Your life will start to feel like gold that's being constantly renewed and refined by fire, he says in verse 18. That's what it's gonna feel like. Why? Because when his resurrection power makes you start seeing money through the lenses of Jesus and not the other way around, your conscience is gonna constantly bug you. It's gonna bug you every day to reprioritize your resources for gospel work. Now, that doesn't mean that you should give everything away, okay? No, no, no. The Bible says to enjoy the fruits of your labor. That's good. That's right. That's fine. The Bible says that those who don't take care of their families are worse than unbelievers. There are many other godly uses for your finances. But still, even with all that, at the very least, we'll end up reprioritizing some things, right? Because none of us are perfect in that area. We will. And that reprioritization process will feel like fire. It'll suck. You know how I know? Because it sucks for me too. <laughs> and I'm a pastor. It does. You don't think I take deep, long breaths <laughs> before I give my resources away to various gospel work in the city? I do. Some breaths I take are so deep, I have yet to exhale. <laughs> it sucks. But that's the refining power the refining fire that Jesus is talking about here. And if we stay true to that purification process, as painful as it might be, we will experience something that riches, Jesus promises here, could never ever counterfeit. What is it? Look at verse 20. We will experience a deep sense of intimacy with Christ. Look at verse 20. Jesus says that if you repent, if you actually let me in 
as the king of your heart instead of money, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. Money's a great counterfeit, okay? It'll make you feel many things that the resurrected Christ can also make you feel. Excitement, fervor, power, victory. But you know the one thing money can't do is it can't love you. It can't love you. It doesn't care about having a meal with you. It's not interested in a relationship with you at all. Which brings us to our third point. What makes the resurrected Christ much better than money, okay? All right. Let's remember again who it is here that Jesus is primarily addressing. It's not non-believers, it's believers, right? Born-again Christians who he loves and reproves and disciplines, verse 19 says. You know, if someone else's kid acts up in public, I could care less, right? Whatever, it's someone else's kid. But if my kid acts up in public, guess what'll happen? You best believe. <laughs> I'll discipline them, right? I'll put them in their place. Why? Because I love them. I feel ownership over them. These are people Jesus feels ownership toward. These are his people, born-again Christians. But what makes this confusing is, if these are born-again Christians who Jesus loves, then logically, shouldn't they have already opened the door and let Jesus in? Shouldn't Jesus already be residing in the home of their soul? What does he mean then if you knock all open? And you're absolutely right. Jesus should already be in their house. But see, perhaps he's still hanging out in the living room. There are deeper doors, you know, that lead to deeper rooms in your heart. And Jesus is committed to knocking on each and one of them. And see, money isn't. Money doesn't care about having a deeper relationship with you, which really is the problem with these counterfeit gods, right? We submit to their demands, but they could care less about us. They pretend to, but it's always, the Indonesian slang, pehape, right? It's always false promises. What do I mean? Well, okay, if you believe in money, for example, if you serve that as the ultimate thing in your life, you know what you'll feel? You'll always feel poor. You see, if you make your looks ultimate, you will never feel attractive enough. If you make earthly honor ultimate, you'll always feel disrespected by everyone. If you make popularity ultimate, you'll always feel insecure. If you make your kid's success ultimate, they'll always disappoint you. You see, these counterfeit gods, they act like they care, but they never de- deliver on promise. They never do. Why? Because they don't care about you. They'll suck you dry with false promises. But Jesus here is saying, he is interested in you. He's knocking, and he actually wants to have a meal with you, a relationship with you. And you know how you know that he's not lying? You know that he's not lying by remembering how it is that you and him ended up in the same house under the same roof in the first place. How did you get there? Hmm? How did you and him end up in the same house to begin with? It wasn't because you worked really, really hard. It wasn't because you signed up for tons of overtime hours It wasn't because you sacrificed your whole life for him, like money will demand of you. No, no. The Bible says that you can be in the same house with him because he worked really, really hard. Because he endured everything. And because he sacrificed his own life for you. That's how you know he's not lying. Money says, die for me, Trade me with everything that really matters in life. Jesus says, I'll die for you so that you can have everything that truly matters in life. He's better. What do you mean money can't give you things that matter in life, Tez? That's naive. Money buys everything that matters in life. 
Anoint your eyes. Salve it. If you don't, you will continue letting the wrong king in. And it's absolutely crucial for the right tenant to end up in the central heart control room that you have. You gotta be careful who goes in deeper. One king will kill you. The other king died for you. It's your call. Will you anoint your eyes? Will you endure the painful process of resource reprioritization and continue to let in the right king into those deeper doors? Or will you continue to be fooled by a counterfeit power that feels like but is not the power of Jesus' resurrection. It's your call. And what's scary is the health of this church is fully dependent on those calls that you make. But this is where my jurisdiction ends. I can't open those doors for you. So I'll stop here, and I'll end in the way that Jesus ended all of these rebukes to these seven churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Father, we've been fooled. Money has presented itself to be a good king. Money has presented itself to be a good God. And Father, help us to not demonize money. It is a good thing. It's just a horrible God. And I pray that you have mercy upon your people. Have mercy upon this church. Surely none of us prioritize our resources perfectly. Surely the lives of this counterfeit world that has counterfeit gods in it has won in some way in our hearts. But when we fail, Father, let us lift our eyes up to see where you succeeded. Where we are weak, let us see where you are strong. You, the richest being in the universe, became poor. You gave up all of your riches. You died naked on a cross while Roman soldiers were divvying up your, your earthy possessions right below you, mocking you, shaming you. And you did all that so that you can make us spiritually rich and have everything that really matters in life. Protect us, your people, your church, from the lies of money, and may we always look upon Calvary and be driven by the resurrected power of Christ as we also behold the empty tomb, walking towards new creation as agents of gospel renewal in the city that we're in. May you give us ears that hear and actual lives that match it throughout the week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, why don't we stand together and sing this final song.
execution now I dread and Jesus has had all in him is mine alive in him my living hand and clothed in righteousness divine bold I approach bold I approach Friends, that question we kept asking in that song, why would Jesus die for me? That question, that question mark, why should I gain from his reward? That should be the question that helps us combat all of the rebukes we've heard in the past seven weeks. So many ro things wrong with the church, including ours. Lack of love, we saw that in First Church. Id idolatry, worshiping money, many, many things. Heresies. The only way we can fight them is not by our own strength, but it's by always asking that question, why would my God die for me? That'll be the fuel behind our repentance, and I pray that we ask it every single day. Receive now, friends, your benediction as you leave and become agents of renewal in the city that we love. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now go in his peace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here be.